Um, and finally, to submit the signed accounts uh, to headquarters. Um, the main purpose of that these days is so that we can show our uh, national auditors that the underlying accounts of local associations, which form part of the overall consolidated picture, have, have been properly approved. Other principal tasks, well, making, making payments, um, managing bank relationships and as far as is necessary. Um, as I mentioned, keeping executive appraised of the financial position of a local association um, and the submission of the financial records to HQ to enable the accounts preparation to take place. I mentioned that we come on to income expenditure and controls and so on uh, in a little bit, little bit more detail. So I think it's probably worth going back to the constitution and just thinking about what is allowed and what's not allowed in terms of expenditure. Um, constitutions do not just come, just do not contain a clear list of you can pay for this, you can't pay for that. So it's a matter of sort of looking at different um, proposed expenditures in the context of different parts of the constitution. Rule three is the key thing. Um, expenditure must be pursuant to the functions of the association. Um, so there's a list of what the key functions of an EIS local association are, and fundamentally, expenditure has to be in has to be consistent with those uh, with those functions. Honor area very much allowed. We'll come back to this later. Um, but uh, honor area is allowed by the standard constitution, and it's up to the executive to make decisions um, in in that. Well, sorry, up to the annual business meeting to make the decisions. Um, in relation to honor area, but we'll come back to that in more detail later. Um, reimbursement of expenses incurred. So if any of the executive members or any other anybody else undertaking work on behalf of the local association um, has expended, has incurred expenditure in doing that, whether that be mileage or coffees or whatever, um, you know, these can be reimbursed. Um, but you know, obviously there's there's a reasonableness um test on that. And if you have any concerns over the reasonableness of expense claims that are being submitted, speak to your fellow executive members. Um, don't just don't just sit in it and worry about it. Um, local charitable donations are also also allowed. Um, so um, many local associations make um, small donations to I don't know, a local Christmas appeal or something like that um, in, in their area. That's very much consistent with um, national EIS policy. It's consistent with the objectives of the association because you are supporting um, your, your area. Things that are not allowed, um, untaxed round sum expense payments to officials or members. So for example, you cannot pay your LA secretary 200 pounds a month for undocumented phone calls, letters, whatever, um, that that is not allowed. That's, that creates a tax problem for the association and for the institute. And it also means that there's expenditure going out that is not supported by um, invoices or other documents. Expenditure on campaigning, which is inconsistent with national policy is another important one. This goes back to um, rule three that I mentioned before. Um, because rule three says that an associate association in its campaigning must be guided by national policy. So um, whilst it doesn't mean that you can't uh, campaign on local issues where nationally there isn't a policy, it might be something very specific. Um, but if there's an area where the national organization has policy, um, EIS local associations do not have the power to campaign in contradiction to that national policy. So then we move on to recording the authorization of expenditure. Um, for large items, um, the principal thing is to go back to minutes. So if it is a significant donation or if it is something unusual, capital expenditure, for example, you want to buy um, additional IT equipment or office equipment or something like that, 
then it is always best if that is minuted by the LA executive so that it can be shown that the person who has placed the order has done it with the permission of the executive. Um, in an ideal world, you have purchase orders, but you know we actually very rarely use them HQ. I would not encourage a system of purchase orders at uh, at local association level. It's it's easier just to minute minute things than actually have written purchase orders. Invoice approval um, quite useful if you receive invoices to have an invoice initialed by an LA office bearer to show that it's been approved for payment particularly if it's anything non-recurring. Um, and then you might want to consider authorization thresholds. Maybe something over £500 requires the approval of two committee members. Maybe some, maybe approval of items over £2,000 should be minuted. Um, this is not set in stone. It's not in any uh, constitution as far as I'm aware, but it might just be something that you would like to consider as good practice. Bookkeeping, um, Lindsay will issue a spreadsheet each year um, for as the cash book format, which will allow treasurers to record the expenditure that is going through their bank. Um, there is a, a new one about to come out. We have recently changed our accounting system at HQ. Um, that necessitates changes some of the coding that's on the, these forms. Um, so Lindsay is going to issue a new template shortly and um, she has told me that there's a few local associations have already submitted their um expenditure summary for quarter one if you've already done that in the old format that's fine we can we can translate it quite easily so no requirement to do it again uh, but uh say the new format will be coming out shortly and if you can use that going forward we would be very grateful Turning to banking relationships, so this, this is a conversation I've had um, over the past year or so with, with a few treasurers. Um, our preferred supplier for banking is the Unity Trust Bank. Um, all our central HQ banking is now through Unity Trust. Um, for those of, us, those of you who may not know anything about Unity Trust, and uh, they're not a major high street bank, they're a relatively small bank. They are largely owned by the trade union movement. In fact, EIS does have a small shareholding in the bank it's, itself. Um, we find them excellent, get very good personal service from our relationship manager. They've got a good online platform, nice and clear. Um, and uh, so, and actually in terms of bank charges, they are much cheaper than any of the mainstream banks, such as Royal Bank Scotland and, and Bank of Scotland. Um, local associations do have the power to hold other banking relationships. I'm aware that I think there's seven or eight of the local associations that don't currently bank with uh, Unity Trust. Um, if you have your own reasons for doing, for doing so, that's absolutely fine. If you would like any assistance from any of us at HQ, in, in relation to potentially changing to Unity Trust, we're very happy to give you assistance in, in that as, as well. Um, say Unity Trust serves serve us, serve us all very well. I, I do notice that the local associations that bank with Unity Trust pay about half as much in terms of annual bank charges as those that are with RBS. Um, I mentioned briefly online online banking. Um, I'd strongly recommend that local associations do register for online banking. It really makes life a lot easier. Um, apart from anything else, if you're missing a bank statement, it means you can just print it off and you, you don't need to sort of go to a branch or try and get through to, try and get through to a phone line or something like that to order a replacement statement. Um, but very much, very much recommend that uh, local associations do um, make use of online banking arrangements. It also makes life much quicker if you are paying, uh, paying bills, paying invoices. Um, checks these days are expensive, 
um, you know, pay an additional charge of 30 pence per cheque. They're time consuming, they're slow, <laughs> old fashioned. We'd really prefer that you didn't use cheques going forward. Um, online banking is really so intuitive now. Um, and again, if, if you're unsure about that, you want some help in setting it up or using an online banking system, um, Lindsay, Lisa and myself, all very happy, all very happy to help with that. Um, direct debits, um, quite, quite simple to set that up through online banking as well. Um, if you've got if you've got regular bills, um, if you've got an office and you're paying heat and light regularly, set it up as a set it up as a direct debit. It just gives you as a treasurer less less to worry about on a monthly or quarterly basis. Thinking about uh, bank signatories, um, this is quite important because um, a few years ago when I was working in the accounting profession and people were just sort of starting to make the move from making most of their payments by cheque uh, to making payments online, what I tended to find as an auditor was that organisations had the most strict documented procedures for Check signatures, you know, two signatures required of the checks over five hundred pounds. One of them has to be the chairman, whatever. Um, and then they moved to online payments, and suddenly the bookkeeper could make the online payments, and there was uh, there was no oversight as to what online payments were being made. So we don't want to get there. So what I would suggest is that um, if you're setting up online banking, or if you have already set up online banking. You should be registering um, three or four of your office bearers or committee members as online users. Um, you can set up authorization levels for payments. So it may be that your president, the chair, has to um, be one of the authorizing parties if the payments are over £10,000. Um, if you have administrative staff, yes, they can be one of the signatories, but I would recommend that one committee member should always or one executive member should always be um, a signatory required to make an online payment. The way these things tend to work is that if you are a signatory, you will get your own login for the online banking. So, for example, how things work at HQ is that uh, Lindsay or Lisa will set up online payments. They will email me and say, can you go into the bank and authorize that payment? I log into the bank. I click authorize um, and that payment is away. It's very, it's very straightforward, um, but and very secure as well. So rule of thumb, try and make sure try and make sure your online payment arrangements are at least as secure as your check payment arrangements. And the last thing which is very important because I am aware that um, office bearers and local associations do change and on an annual basis. So please make it somebody's responsibility to ensure that the lists of signatories are kept current, because if you don't, you will get into a mess. You'll suddenly find you want to do something through your bank and the bank will say, well, I need the approval of X, Y or Z. And then you find that X, Y and Z are no longer on your um, executive. You may not even know where they are and it can make life very difficult. Uh, so, bank reconciliations, um, what I mean by a bank reconciliation is um, a reconciliation between the bank balance on the bank account and your cash book spreadsheets. Um, it's best practice to prepare such a reconciliation quarterly um, and the main things to watch out for are things like um, bank charges that might go straight into the bank straight into the bank account. You won't have a record. You won't have an invoice for them necessarily. Um, direct debit payments, um, and perhaps any sort of slight differences between what's on an invoice and what's actually being paid. Just, these are the kind of differences to look out for. But it's very it's very good practice to make sure that your cash book statement, your cash book spreadsheets, are in line with your bank statements on a regular basis. 
I then want to turn just to to cards um, there are a range of different practices across local associations in relation to cards. Um, some have some have credit cards. Some some um, officers have credit cards. So if somebody's incurring expenditure on behalf of the association on a very regular basis, it might make sense to get them a um, a credit card for for the local association. Um, however. I would limit it to those who are incurring expenses on a very regular basis and probably of a reasonable amount because there obviously is a cost associated with holding a credit card um, and and it just I suppose to an extent it creates hassle as well um, and we, what, what we want to do in the world of local association finance is keep it as simple as we can. Um, you can get uh, credit cards through uh, Unity Trust Bank, which until I think last year you weren't able to do. Um, certainly centrally at HQ, we've now converted all our uh, credit cards into, um, the, into ones that are connected with Unity Trust. Um, expenditure limits. Well, I mean, as, as you know, banks are very keen to give quite large uh, limits on, on credit cards sometimes, but I would be inclined to keep it to what is required. Um, a card with a five hundred pound limit obviously stops. Is obviously from a security perspective um, an awful lot better than one with a five thousand pound limit. Um, just apart from anything else to protect you from fraud. Um, payments. Well, credit card payments. We just you get a statement. You pay it in the normal way. I don't think there's anything uh, particularly. Um, hassle, hassle worthy about that, um, but uh, I say just uh, as I said, the credit card statement needs to get to the treasurer. Need to make sure the payments are made on time to avoid interest charges and penalties. I've then mentioned pocket cards. Um, I think there's only two local associations that currently use pocket cards. Pocket cards are basically a prepaid card, um, which is a uh, promoted by MasterCard, so it's you know it's a re reputable enough organization. Um, and what it just means is that instead of having a credit card, um, in effect, your um, officers are getting a card that's got a prepaid amount. You load it up with 500 pounds or 200 pounds or whatever, and that's money that they've got and they can spend in just the same way as you would spend on a credit card, but it's not there's not a bill coming at the end of the month. If you run out of money, you just top it up again. Um, is there any great benefit in that for a local association? Again, it's there are there are no rules to say no. If if it suits your circumstances, um, very much worth very much worth doing. Um, it's cheaper on a monthly basis than running a credit card. I think Lindsay told me it was one pound ninety nine a month per card. Um, so. If that's something, a prepaid card is something that's of interest, um, probably best to speak to Lindsay in the first instance and she can give you advice as to how that can can be set up. Um, but um, again, probably only worthwhile if people are incurring significant levels of expenses and don't really want to go through the rigmarole of um, incurring the expenses themselves and then claiming them back to an existing expenses system. Before I move on to the funds and investment side, then we get any questions at the moment? Um, and can somebody tell me if there are any hands up? Because I've just got I've just got my overall uh, slides on the screen. There's no hands up yet, Joy. Perfect. Okay, we will move on to funds and investments. Um, so many of you will be aware that we are currently in the process of setting up a central investment fund for local associations and um, looking to put some of the excess funds um, held in the LA world to to work. Purpose for this of this really. To try and make a bit of money from LA reserves again um, bank interest rates are currently 
well, yesterday they were at historic lows. Uh, today they're at slightly above historic lows. Um, but I can't see the interest payable on any readily accessible bank accounts um, rising above zero or 0 0.1 in the foreseeable future. However, what is still happening is inflation is still rising. Um, doing nothing means that uh, you're basically losing up to 4% of your reserves per annum in, in real terms, as economists say, and not taking into account inflation. So when you're thinking about this, what are your surplus funds? Well, I would suggest that your surplus funds are money that you're unlikely to require for operational purposes in the foreseeable future. Um, most local associations do not have large occasional cash flow requirements. Um, you don't do generally a lot of capital expenditure. Um, I suppose the only real um, major operational cash flow requirements might be if there was a major campaign ongoing and there was expenditure incurred at a local level in relation to that. We saw that a couple of years ago in the previous pay campaign. For most, I would suggest retaining a float 10, 15, 20,000 pounds for cash flow blips, unforeseen expenditure is perfectly adequate. So if you're carrying reserves, cash reserves of 60,000 pounds, it may be that 40, 45, even 50,000 pounds of that you could class as, as surplus funds. The reason that we're looking at doing the investment plans on a centralised basis are principally that local associations, because you are unincorporated entities, you do not legally have the power to hold investments in your own names. Um, EIS headquarters, because the EIS is a body incorporated by Royal Charter, it does have the power to hold investments in its own, in its own name. Um, We've chosen a couple of funds that are not um, the most aggressive. They're not, they're not going to potentially give the highest return in the marketplace, but ones that got lower risk and lower volatility. By volatility, I mean some investments will go up and down on a quite significant basis on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, I suppose the ultimate example of that would be Bitcoin. Um, you know, people have made a lot of money in bit Bitcoin if they got in at the right time and got out at the right time. People have lost a lot of money on Bitcoin if they got in at the wrong time and had to get out for some reason at the wrong time. Um, so the funds that we're looking to invest local association money in are ones that should proceed in a relatively straight line, um, regardless of uh, the movements of uh, the market overall. That's not to say they will not fall. Um, and I was just looking yesterday at the two funds that uh, we're proposing to invest the money in. And you know, in common with the wider market, if we had invested that money on 30th September, it would be down by about one and a half percent now. Um, not great, not but not something to panic about. The overall market, you know, if you're pure equity portfolio, um, that those funds might be down by three, four percent compared with 30th September when the market was actually quite high. The funds also we're looking at are accumulation funds. That means that there's not cash distribution com coming out. Um, the dividends are automatically reinvested into other fund units. Um, you'll get a quarterly report. Those that are participating in the scheme will get a quarterly report from HQ showing how the investments are doing and what uh, money uh, has been declared as dividends and, and reinvested. So you will, you will get that reporting so you can keep an eye on it and treasurers so that you can report to your executive um, on how things are doing. Um, also important to know that investments can be added to or redeemed at any time. Um, there is no 90 day notice or anything like that. If, if you need some of your money out or if you want to invest some more money, let me know. We'll be able to line that up with fund managers and um, probably take about a week to do. But, you know, if, if you actually need the money in advance of that, then HQ would be able to help. 
there is a wrinkle um, which has come up regarding tax um, and when we did the previous webinar about these, this was left outstanding because I was waiting on advice from our tax advisors. Um, it is believed that the dividends that are declared from the fund will be will be taxable. Um, so there might be small amounts of tax paid from the from the local associations, but clearly that is only currently 19% of the dividends received. You don't receive, you don't pay tax on any capital gain on the investment until such time as you withdraw money from that. Um, and again, that would be at roughly 19% of your gain. So you're never actually going to lose out because you're having to pay tax. You just get effectively a lower return than you might otherwise get. Um, I should also add that, um, that that would mean that there will be a requirement for tax returns for local associations, but we'll deal with that from HQ. Nobody at LA level really needs to worry about, about that from an admin perspective. So moving on, I did want to just touch on AGM expense claims. Uh, this is some, something that people do ask about from time to time. Um, in advance of a traditional face-to-face -face AGM, um, there will be uh, claim forms uh, sent out. Lindsay will organise that. Um, current limits are up to £84 per night per delegate for dinner, bed and breakfast, um, as well as claims for travel and uh, daily, subs daily subsistence. Um, sorry, I've got that wrong. No, claims for travel and daily subs subsistence get made to HQ by the individual delegates but um, the accommodation bills that are paid by the local associations, they can reclaim up to £84 per night from HQ. Uh, claim forms, as I say, are issued by Lindsay on the first day of the AGM, and we'd be very grateful if you could submit these as soon as possible thereafter, and certainly by 31st of August, as that is the Institute's year end. So it's, it's good to have these in so that we're not including any estimates in our year-end accounts. I said we'd move on to honoraria and payroll. Um, so setting honoraria, there are no formal rules um, for the level of honoraria or indeed how many people um, can get honoraria. This was something that was discussed at the focus group meetings with LA secretaries earlier in the year. Um, if there is any doubt and you want any assistance or guidance, um, HQ can certainly provide some anonymized benchmarking data. But what we won't do is say you can't do you can't do this or you can't pay an honorarium to person X. Local associations work in many different ways. Some have um, some have staff that are employed who do a lot, a lot of the administration work. Some pay an honorarium to an assistant secretary who does um, some of the administration work. Um, some um, only have two, maybe three people um, in key roles that get honoraria. Um, I think the highest number of people getting an honorary from a local association is seven, um, or was the last the last year that I looked at. Um, so it's it's very much up to individual local associations, their annual business meetings, their executive recommendations um, as to what is um, fair and reasonable given the way that each local association wants to wants to work. Um, Tax status, um, all honoraria that are paid are subject to income tax and NIC. So that that is why you are not paying the honoraria directly to the individuals yourselves as local associations. What you do is you advise um, HQ as to how much is to be paid Lisa will process that through payroll um, and advise 
the local association of the gross amount. We will invoice each local association for the gross amount twice a year, um, usually in December and June. Um, and as I said at the bottom there, treasurers are asked to advise Lisa about na names and amounts in advance of these payment dates. Um, and it's good practice that agreed levels of honoraria should be minuted um, so that um, there's absolutely no doubt that amounts paid out have been approved by at the relevant level. So I mentioned that the payroll is operated by HQ. That means that there is no requirement for uh, local associations to register for PAYE, whether for honoraria or whether in respect of employees that you have. Um, similarly, uh, the payments to all the individuals and the payment of the tax and NIC over to HMRC are dealt with by headquarters. All you need to do is pay the invoice. For those local associations who have uh, staff, um, these staff will either be enrolled into the EIS superannuation fund or for the NEST scheme, which is for those who have chosen not to join the superannuation fund. Uh, the NEST scheme is auto enrollment. So um, unless somebody has specifically opted out of the NEST scheme, then we require to make uh, pension deductions and pension payments, employers' pension payments um, on their on their behalf. Um, and then the last part there is what I've already mentioned. Lisa will invoice the in issue invoice it to LA for the gross cost of salaries and for our area. Um, I say if you've got any queries, please raise them promptly so that we can um, identify any differences or misunderstandings. Somebody who see a, can see a clock tell me how we're doing for time. It's quarter to 12, John. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just my, my, my screen's gone full screen, so I can't even see the clock at the bottom right hand corner of my screen. Um, so moving on to property issues. Um, those many of the local associations do have their own uh, properties that they lease. Some of them get them on an informal basis from local associations. Some um, are asked to um, sign up to a formal lease. Where you're asked to sign up to a formal lease, um, I would ask that you give headquarters the opportunity to review the documentation before signing. Um, local, local authorities will almost always get their legal department um, involved. Um, which sometimes will mean that the document is six times as long as it actually needs to be. Um, and uh, there might actually be some, uh, some traps for the un unwary. Um, I would not normally ask for there to be an external legal review of the documents, but we have had some in the past where um, there were so many strings attached. I think when Renfrewshire signed up for their current office, um, there was a particularly complicated, was just before I started, but I think that was a particularly complicated document we were presented with. So we did actually take some external legal advice in, in, that, in that occasion. Um, things to look out for, um, alteration and redecoration. Um, you've got to watch out that um, if you do something to your office, um, what's your requirement to reinstate that at the end of the lease? And how expensive is that going to be? Um, you know, that could just be, um, you know, if you really want yellow wallpaper, um, you spend some money putting up yellow wallpaper in your office. But if the landlord doesn't uh, like the yellow wallpaper and thinks it might um, hamper his ability to relet the office once you move out, he's usually quite entitled to say, you no, know, I gave you with cream wallpaper. Can you please put cream wallpaper back before you go? So it's important just keep an eye on that um, not to get any unexpected liabilities at, at the end of the lease. You will also generally have a duty to maintain the office in good order. Um, that's not normally a major problem, um, but uh, as I say, you will, um, you, you could get stung for that if there was some uh, damage 
there. Um, this is also associated with dilapidations, standard, um, standard term in Scottish property leases. Um, the landlord has a right to get the property back from you in the same condition that he gave it to you. So um, that could include things like uh, coffee stains, coffee stains on the carpet, um, pen marks on the wall, whatever. Um, but um, you just got to got to watch that when you're moving out of a property that um, you are aware that if there is damage that was not there when you moved in, um, then you were likely to have to repay uh, the cost of that damage to the landlord. That does also bring on to another point which I didn't specifically mention there, which is that when you move into a new office, it is very important to agree um, the state of the office in terms of dilapidations with the landlord, take photographs if necessary, if there's any damage there, uh, to make sure that you're not going to get stung for dilapidations at the end of the lease for something that was there when you moved in. I mentioned insurance um, the uh, equipment in your office is generally covered by EIS policies. Um, however, the premises themselves are not. So if there is a requirement within your lease for you to keep the premises themselves insured, then please, please contact me. I will help you set something up. Um, usually if you're just renting a room, the landlord will pay the insurance and it'll be included within your within your rent or within your service charge, but it's something just to look out for. Um, and lastly, um, security. Um, as you know, um, as a trade union, we're dealing with a lot of sensitive personal data. So it is important that this data is kept physically and digitally secure. So um, it is your responsibility to make sure that uh, access to the EIS local association office is secure, um, whether that just be as sim simple as a uh, lock and key, but if it is, who else has a key for the door? Um, if there are other people, for example, um, school cleaners or office cleaners or whatever, who have got access to the room in the absence of any local association staff, then it's very important to make sure that any sensitive personal data is locked away when you are not present. Um, but also data, um, make sure that if you're using a common uh, internet uh, Wi-Fi system, then that, that is secure. Thomas will be very pleased to give you advice on that, just to take reasonable precautions to make sure that the IT that you have within the local association cannot be compromised, personal data cannot be uh, stolen. But GDPR is for another day. There'll be a session for local association secretaries on GDPR, I think sometime in the spring, um, which I'll be lining up with David shortly. So just a couple more topics before we close. Um, Year-end processes, well, submission of financial information to HQ after the year-end. Um, we've tried to accelerate the process from how it used to be, um, and so we really would appreciate it if we could get spreadsheets in by uh, end, of, end of September, really, so that we can get the local association accounts uh, prepared at the earliest possible stage. Um, as I mentioned, the local association accounts feed into the overall Institute accounts as part of the consolidation exercise. So the sooner we can get the local associations all in place and the local association consolidation done, the sooner we can prepare the overall accounts of the Institute. And it only takes one association not to have submitted their data to hold up the whole process because we can't prepare a local association consolidation with 31 data sets because as soon as we get the 32nd one, we have to change all the figures. As most of you will be aware, individual local association accounts are no longer audited. 
Um, having reviewed that situation last year, um, it was clear that there was no value was actually being ad added by an external auditor looking at uh, local association accounts. They had no real understanding of how a local association worked, and they actually weren't going to pick up anything that was of value to us as an institute or you as an executive. However, as I mentioned, local association accounts still form part of the overall EIS accounts, and therefore the auditors might still request information as part of their group audit. Um, we're well through the audit now, um, and as yet, the auditors haven't really requested any information in relation to local associations, apart from post year end bank statements, which I think almost all of you have now supplied. Um, so, but still might still might happen. Um, and the last thing I've written there is formal approval of the accounts. Um, I think you've all received the uh, the final accounts to put to your uh, executive now, and I think most most associations have come back and either supplied a copy of the signed accounts or given me confirmation that the accounts have been approved by their executive. Um, if you haven't done that yet, I would be grateful if you could um, to just give, just give me something to show to the auditors, um, as I say, to confirm that, um, that this has been done. Oh. Corporation tax. Um, at present, Glasgow Local Association is the only one which is having to uh, submit a corporation tax return and pay uh, corporation tax. That's because they have their own um, investments. Um, if we do have to deal with tax for local associations, it'll be dealt with by HQ. We're not asking any local association treasurers to become corporate tax experts overnight. Um, your subscription income is never taxable. Um, that's, a, that's a general exemption. Um, and currently, HMRC have agreed that interest income is not taxable, where the amount of tax payable would be less than £100. So that's why, even though in the past few years, various local associations have had, um, have received untaxed income on their bank deposit accounts, etc., cetera, um, we've taken advantage of this exemption so that that income does, has not had to be um, returned to Companies House, uh, to HMRC. My last slide today is just uh, just a quick refresher on setting subscription levels, and I suppose this is unchanged for many years. So this is really for new treasurers, if there are any on the call. Um, we have the five band model, um, which means that um, HQ set five potential bands for local association subscriptions, and allows each um, LA discretion as to which of the five bands they choose to set their um, their subscription at. Um, that should be reviewed annually um, for appropriateness and ratified at the annual business meeting. The subscription levels, the bands for 2023, 2022-23 year um, are going to be unchanged from 2021-22, and that was approved at the last meeting of HQ's executive. In selecting a subscription band, um, executives should have um, regard to their expected levels of expenditure, maybe their surplus or deficit for the previous year, whether they can foresee any exceptional costs coming out, for example, local campaign expenditure, um, and indeed whether they want to use any of the carried surplus funds to subsidise their activities in, in the coming year. Um, a little bit like Honoraria, there are no fixed rules. Um, HQ can provide advice, but we're not going to tell you to do one thing or the other. Um, it is entirely up to local executive to set where they're um, where they're going to put their subscriptions on the five band model. So that's all I really wanted to say today that I had. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions that anybody has either today 
or um, by email in future days and weeks. Um, just trying to work out how I come to take this off share again. Um, stop. Um, so yes, if anybody's got any questions, very happy to take them. Um, see, there was one hand up there from Fife. Is that Peter? No, it's Jane. Jane, hi. <laughs> Um, John, I just wanted to ask a quick question about what you said about honoraria, that um, the level should be minuted. Should that be the level for each individual um, uh, person in receipt of the honoraria, or should it be a grand total? Um, so, for example, if I get 10,000 and my assistant secretary gets £2.50, should it be recorded as 10,000 to 50, or do we have to admit that I get 10,000? I would suggest that you... I would suggest that you should be open um, with your honoraria because because the level of honoraria is being um, is being approved at the annual business meeting. Um, any member of the association is entitled to attend the annual business meeting, so I would recommend that the minutes should be clear as to what's been approved. Otherwise, you could get a situation where somebody could come along and say. Um, Okay, the annual the minutes state that the annual business meeting said that honoraria would be ten thousand two pound and two pound fifty, um, but it did not say that it would be split this way. What was your basis on splitting it in the way that you did? Um, and that could just cause trouble. I don't see any. I don't see that there should be any reason not to break it down. You may not want to put names against it. You may want to put positions against it. Um, uh, I think I would probably recommend that on reflection, um, but I think it should be broken down that says secretary gets this much, president gets this much, treasurer gets this much. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Another hand up there. Louise? Yes. Hello. Hi, John. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about credit cards, but we're wondering, we'd rather get a debit card. We're with the Unity Trust, and I think we've looked into it Heather said she'd looked into it before and it's quite complicated. So we're wondering if we can get some help with that. Um... Uh, no problem at all. I, I will I, I will delegate that to Lisa, who okay. deals with most of the debit and credit card things. So yeah. um, Lisa, you're on the you're on the call somewhere, aren't you? Um, yeah, if, yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. with Lou, that'd be great. Great, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands up for you, John, but um, as you say, people can just get in touch with you if, if they need to ask anything else. 